And I record it. Start over. You never know when you you never know when you plant the seed. You never know. For them right now, it's a field trip day. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. This is a field trip day. We're out in the classroom. Okay. But you got to plant the seed. You just never know, right? Okay. All right. So we're going to go back to now chemical digestion. Four types of secretions complete the final stage, and that is chemical digestion. Okay, so look at things like enzymes, mucus, hormones, okay, and bile. And so looking at these, okay, enzymes we've already talked about, mucus, mucus acts also as a protector, yes or no, okay. Looking at the hormones, <laughs> here we go again, all right. So it talks about, what's that blue word under there? Secretin. Secretin, that's the one. So if you look, as the food mass entering the, uh, from the stomach, mucosal cells in the upper part of the small intestine, may basically the duodenum, okay, produce a gastrointestinal hormone called what? Am I alone in kind of Secretin, huh? <laughs> no. What'd you say? No. <laughs> oh. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, Who's got the hearing loss? That's what I want to know. I know I do. Okay. So, secretary in turn stimulates the what? Pancreas. Thank you. To send what? Alkaline. Into the where? <laughs> to do what? That's Thank you. Now you understand. Slow down. Say it again. Yeah, this is on page 30, baby. <laughs> Everybody turn to page 30. Under the italics of hormones. You know how to make a hormone? Don't pay her. <laughs> I had to say it. You know, it's the only joke I know. It really is. So, you know, I, I, I heard this from our AMP teacher. She said, what's the difference? Hormone. What's the difference? You can't hear an enzyme. You can't what? You can't hear an enzyme. Oh my god, that's great. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> oh, <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Listen. Someone take this little one out later and explain it to her. Okay. No worries. I already keep going now. Okay. Bile. Okay. What does it say? It emulsifies what? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, good. Produced in the whale. The liver. As a dilute, watery solution, then concentrated, stored in the whale. Oh, concentrated. And we have the potential to make stones. Yes or no? Yes. Who's more at risk for stones? Do you know? Male or female? Male. Female. How many females in here? How many people in here, if you had a cholecystectomy, you had your gallbladder removed, stand up, please. There's your stats, guys. Female, 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 female. See it? More in females. You know why it happens? You can see it because of the up and down dieting and things, okay? Aside from genetic, okay? Up and down dieting, fad diets, things like that, okay? So, it says here, when the fat enters the duodenum, okay, the local gastrointestinal hormone, where it is it? Cholecystokinin. <laughs> Cholecystokinin. Choly, C H O L E tells you it's coming from where? The gallbladder. The gallbladder. See it now, guys? See it? You're learning. It's happening. Okay, CCK is secreted in the, uh, by the glands. Intestinal mucosa stimulates the gallbladder to do what? Contract and release. Uh huh. Okay. And by means of enterohepatic circulation, molecules of bile are reabsorbed back and returned to the liver and gallbladder to be used over and over and over again. Okay? All right? So looking at a CCK also acts on the pancreas to stimulate the release of enzymes that break down fats, proteins, and carbs. Does everybody see that, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Okay? And then you guys have a nice little summary of macronutrient digestion on table 2-2. That really surmises it nicely, okay? So end products of digestion are then ready for absorption. We have broken them down to its simplest form. Is everybody with me on that, yes or no? Okay? All right, looking at surface structures, okay? 
And here is a beautiful depiction picture on page 31. You all with me on this? Okay. So you have the mucosal folds, and again, looking at, they have different types of convolutions and projections, greatly expand the absorbing surface. So that's what Brittany was saying, was to expand the what? The surface area, right? So mucosal fo folds, okay? Then you have the villi, that's your finger-like projections. Do you all see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, on these folds called villi can be seen through a simple compound microscope. And then you have microvilli, we actually call that the brush border. Okay, extremely small projections, and now they're showing you of the microvilli, okay? And the array of microvilli covering the edge of each villus is called a brush border, and then it says each villus has an ample network of, what does it say there? Uh-huh, for the absorption of what? Stop right there, what is that? One what? What's a saccharide? Sugar. Sugar. Yes, ma'am. Very good. Okay. And what? Amino acids. Amino acids, right? Okay. And then the central lymph vessel is called a what? Uh-huh. For the absorption of what? Acids. See it? Didn't we talk about that? This is just a reiteration now. Is it sinking in yet? I hope. I won't tell any more jokes. We're okay. way off. Okay, so if you look at, let's, let's, we're going to go through this anyway, okay? Look at the end products of digestion. You all see that little box there? Okay, because we're going to go through it anyway, because your next two chapters are carbs and lipids, yes or no? Okay, look at the end products. You see it? Glucose, fructose, and what? Galactose. Okay, we'll get more into that later. Look at the fat. What do you have? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Dye meaning what? What does that mean to you when you see the word dye? Two. Thank you. And what? Glycerol. And then protein is what? And I still have two amino acids joined with one peptide bond. Dipeptide. Okay? Is everybody with me there? All right. End products. All right, so again, looking at these things increases the inner absorbing surface area about a thousand times over that of the outside covering, okay? And you have your key terms there. It talks about osmolarity, yes or no, okay? Um, if you didn't drink water for a little while, okay, the osmolarity of your body would go up. The hypothalamus would sit there and go, geez, it's awfully salty in here. Let me, let me stimulate the sensation for thirst to get them to drink. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. The osmolarity is going up. So it's about looking at concentration of body fluids. Okay. Uh, mucus, secretin, it's all there. Okay. If, you're knowing, if you know these key terms, guys, you will know the test. I can't put it more plainly. Okay. Uh -huh. Huh? I'm not putting LOM on there. I just wanted to introduce it. That's all, okay? Um, there may be some similar things, okay, but you are gonna have LOM on future tests, absolutely. What I do is I just kind of build you up. By the time you get to med surge, you have everything on it, okay? All right? So, mechanisms of absorption, here we go, okay? We're gonna bring this back to you. Passive diffusion and <coughs> osmosis. Okay, now, I know you had this in A&P, at least you should have, okay? Diffusion, you ready? I've got bottled water here. Am I hurting your brain there, Mr. Albert? A little bit. Okay, <laughs> I, have, I have water here, and I take, what are those drops that you put in your water for flavor? Is it Mia? Mia. Mia drops, okay, I take a Mia drop, and I put it in the water. I'm not gonna shake it, though. Okay, because in that Mia drop, it's very concentrated. And what it's going to do is be a diffusion. If I just were to let it sit there, the, con the, the concentrated material in that one drop is going to spread out into the water. That's diffusion. Okay, I go from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Very passive. You with me on that? Okay. Now you look at osmosis. And the only thing you want to remember about osmosis is it deals with water. That's it. So I have a semi-permeable membrane. There's some great videos. I've, I've got them all on your D2L about hypertonic, hypotonic, things like that. 
but you have a semi-permeable membrane and you have solutes or solution, solutes on one side and little solutes on another, okay? I put the water here. The water will flow to the area of more solutes just like the water flows with dumping syndrome, yes or no? So what you're seeing with dumping syndrome is not diffusion but osmosis because why? What is it doing? It's pulling what? Water. See it? Oh, I'm just shocking the hell out of you people. There's like no expression, okay? All right, but you need to know this, okay? Let's look at the next one, okay? <laughs> facilitated diffusion. If I facilitate you into becoming nurses, am I helping you? Okay, this is how insulin works. Insulin is a hormone, okay, or a protein really, that goes and not carries the the insulin, okay, or carries the glucose and puts it into the cell. It's facilitating it getting into the cell, okay? So that would be facilitated. Molecules too large to pass easily through will need pores or need assistance, either a protein pore or something in that cell membrane to get it to go into the cell. Does that make sense? <laughs> yes, ma'am. So passive diffusion doesn't need help all, but needs help? It's no, it's just it's you need help. You need help. Uh, the glucose is going to be hard to get into the cell. So if I'm insulin, I have a way of getting that cell to open and allowing the glucose in. I'm helping the glucose get into the cell. I'm facilitating. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So would what happens to uh, fatty acids, would that be considered fat, uh, protein whenever the proteins wrap around the... Um, You're talking about the lipoproteins? Yeah. Okay. Is We're carrying out of the body. Uh, in a sense, it's like that. Yes, but I don't want to... It's more, it's more molecular than that. Uh, okay. All right. Let's look at energy dependent, and you hear the word active which means this takes energy. What is the form of energy in a cell? What? ATP. Good. Okay. So such active work requires energy along with the pumping action. And so we have things like the sodium potassium uh, pump. Has anyone heard of this? Uh -huh. Okay. You got to learn about this anyway, so we'll just go ahead and start with it. Okay. Here is your cell. And inside the cell is predominantly what? What would this K mean? Anyone know? Potassium. Potassium. Very good. And outside of the cell is what? Sodium. What? Sodium. Sodium. Okay. And so what happens, what's going to happen here is that the sodium is going to want to flow into the cell and the potassium is going to want to flow out. But there's something here called a sodium potassium pump that continuously kicks the potassium back in and keeps the sodium back out. You with me on that? Yes or no? Okay? So even like when we're learning to draw blood, okay? If you take that tube, okay, and you shake it, you're going to break up blood cells and what's going to leak out? Potassium. And guess what's going to happen? Lab's going to call you with a critical alert say that they have hyperkalemia. that be deadly to the heart? Yeah, but it's also an erroneous result. See, it's very important that we understand the techniques and things that we're doing and that we do them correctly, yes or no, okay? All right, but just so you know, active takes a process, okay? So when you guys have lunch today, you're gonna feel tired after lunch, yes or no? Because it's the body actively breaking down food. Okay, so if the body is actively breaking down food, then it's also using all of these different processes for the food to be absorbed, okay? And so that being said, we're gonna get into it later, there's something called the thermic effect of food. So what I'm gonna explain to you with, the weight, with regards to the weight loss that I had, I learned to eat every three hours. No more three meals a day. Every three hours. We're supposed to graze. Okay? Small amounts. And I'll tell you what's going to happen. Once I do that, I bump up my metabolism because I'm keeping my body working all the time. The other thing I love about it is I'm not eating because I'm hungry. I'm eating just to feed my body. So am I going to make better choices? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes or no? Yeah. 
And then even when I'm sleeping, I'm burning. Isn't that a nice thought? I don't want to go to the gym. I'd rather burn in bed. Hello. <laughs> okay? All right? But that's what I'm saying. So it goes through all these different processes and absorptions where really all, all this is taking place. Okay? Looking at the next one. Okay? Engulfing. Okay? Now you guys heard of phagocytosis, yes or no? So phagocytosis, you have a cell that's going around and eating everything. Okay? Pinocytosis is stationary. I want you to think about a sea anemone on coral. Okay? A sea anemone. Yes? Y'all with me on this? I know I'm a Miami person, but I figured y'all must have seen a sea anemone, right? They sway back and forth, right? And as nutrients pass by, they'll engulf them. We call that pinocytosis. Okay? They, they're stationary. They stay where they are, and that's what you're seeing here. And then breaking everything down to be used. Okay? Pinocytosis. Okay. They talk about forming a vacuole. Smaller whole proteins and fat droplets are absorbed through pinocytosis. Okay. <clears throat> so that's that. Any questions with this? Yes or no? Does it bring back A and P? I hope the answer is yes. I uh, hope. Okay. All right. Routes of absorption. Here we go. This is a big one. Okay. So you're looking at water-soluble monosaccharides, which is what? A one sugar, okay, and amino acids enter directly into the portal blood and travel to the where? Liver. And then the other tissues. I said that, did I not? Okay. Fats go a little bit differently, and we're going to be talking about, here they are, those chylomicrons, yes or no? Okay. I'm trying to find where it is in my book, because here I have highlighted a lot of stuff here. Yeah, I know where, but I'm just looking for the actual term. There it is. Okay. So, looking at fats packaged in a bile complex, what they call a micelle, are carried into cells of the intestinal wall where they are processed into human lipid compounds and form a complex with protein as a carrier. And this is called a lipoprotein. And we talked about this before because I said, you know what HDL and LDL mean? You get a cholesterol test, a panel, right? A lipid panel. And you have HDL and LDL. What do they stand for? Lipoprotein. Good. And? So I need you to understand this again, okay? I want high, high density. Low is gonna lower you in the ground. If those numbers are high, they're gonna lower you in the ground, okay? Because your packaging with high density lipoprotein is gonna carry it out of the body, okay? If it's a low density lipoprotein, then what's gonna happen is just gonna release the fat. Oops, okay? Y'all, but you all get the idea, yes or no, okay? So they're gonna break it down even further, and we are breaking it down, thank you, ma'am. I get down like this, so I have to ask myself, how important is it? Because I may have to go. <laughs> Aging is so wonderful. Okay, and so when we start talking about the fats, they're going to go into, now we have other tests. We have VDL, LDL, and things like that, very low density, that kind of thing. Okay, so when you get your numbers on a cholesterol test, you want your high density to be up there. Okay, not your low density because that will lower you in the ground. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. So now we have chylomicrons flow into the lymph, empty to the cisternae chili. Anybody remember where that was? Yeah, Ooh, it's part of the lymphatic system, yes. right? Where was it? It's right in here, okay? All right, of the lymphatic system, and then enter the venous blood, because I said that lymph recycles, does it not? And where does it dump into? The thoracic duct. The thoracic duct on the left side, or the right lymphatic duct on the, left, on the right side, okay? And that is funny, when you take a look at the picture, it's very uneven as to how it dumps. So the left side really is taking the brunt, okay? All right, so in the subclavian vein, chylomicrons are rapidly cleared from the blood by lipoprotein lipase. Short chain fatty acids are water soluble, okay? So they can be absorbed directly into the where? Into the blood, okay? With carbohydrate and protein breakdown products. So you all seeing how that's working now? Yes or no? That's so why I went through la la uh, language of medicine first. 
because now we're getting a little bit more in depth with the chylomicrons and so forth, right? Okay? All right, looking forward. Okay, now we're going to the colon. Okay, we're out of the small intestine. That's where most of your absorption is taking place. Now we go into the colon, and with the role of absorption here, approximately one to one and a half liters is received from the ileum daily, and 95% of that is reabsorbed, okay? But if you have a, a pathogen or a bug or you have IBS, cerebral bowel syndrome, to where the motility is more rapid, then you're going to be losing a lot of that fluid. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Okay. All right. So passage is controlled by that ileocecal valve. Okay. You're connect when you break down that word, you're connecting the ileum, yes, to the cecum. O is just a combining vowel. That's all. Okay. Water absorption, absorption of water is the main task of the colon. 95% of it is absorbed. Okay. So approximately 100 to 150 milliliters of, we, of water will remain to form the feces. Absorption of water in the colon is important in regulating water balance and eliminating fecal waste. Okay, the amount of water absorbed depends on the what? Motility. If I got diarrhea, I'm really mo mobile, yes or no? There's a lot of motility there, yes? If I'm constipated, what happens with the motility? It slows down, I mean, it just makes sense. And the stool gets hard, yes? Okay, it's still reabsorbing water, okay? So the amount of water absorbed depends on the motility and rate of passage. Also, how much fiber you're taking in, okay? Disease, infection, and osmotic undigested sugars. If I say that to you, what do you think's happening? Is the water going in the colon or going out? If I say to you, osmotic undigested sugars. <laughs> it's staying in. Why is it staying in? Because you have undigested, you didn't absorb them, osmotic, which pulls water, right? You can't digest it. Sugars, which also pulls water, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Okay? <laughs> so the amount of water absorbed affects constipation and diarrhea. It's as simple as that, okay? And so in teaching you guys to be nurses, we're, we're really looking at the body in a simplified way, okay? Amy, if you don't mind, can I share a little bit of your, okay? Her father's blood pressure dropped from like 80, to 80 over 40, okay? Right then as a nurse, my immediate thought is, uh-oh, fluid volume deficit. And you know what? If I have a deficit in fluid, do you think my electrolytes are a little thrown off? Mm -hmm. Yes or no? And if I don't have volume in the body, how can I even perfuse organs of the body? Okay? And I'm not perfusing, so my kidneys don't even put out any urine. Do you know what the a minimal amount of urine should be put out an hour? 30, 30, 30 milliliters, one medicine cup an hour. Okay? So if the body's not putting that out, we got a problem. You with me? So he's in the hospital right now, and I know the first thing the doc said is, fluids! Okay, everybody with me on that? All right. So looking at mineral absorption, sodium and other electrolytes are absorbed from the colon. Many unabsorbed minerals are excreted in the feces. Up to 90% of the calcium and iron in the food we eat is not absorbed. And we are going to talk more about that with iron because there's good sources of iron for absorption, like organ meats versus not good sources for absorption, okay? All right, so when you think about that, 90% of calcium and iron in the food we eat is not absorbed. Well, calcium, we need vitamin D, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you think about iron, wow, 90% of that? No wonder we have so many people out there with iron deficiency anemia. The most common anemia, okay? Is spinach, is it good? Huh? Is it a good iron source? Spinach? Yeah. You want to get more of your iron from animal products. Sorry. Okay, the portion of a mineral intake that is absorbed is important for, for nutrient balance, okay? 
So vitamin absorption, conditions in the GI tract influence vitamin absorption, okay? So when gastric acid is lower than normal, vitamin B12 cannot be released from animal tissues and is lost in the feces. B12, that one is part of pernicious anemia. Everybody with me on that? <coughs> so when, when I look at somebody, it, we can take a look at the cells under a microscope. We call that morphology, okay? When I look at somebody with iron deficiency anemia, the cells are microcytic, meaning that they're small, microcyte, CYT is cell, microcytic, and they're pale, okay? If I were to look at the cell of somebody with pernicious anemia, those cells, you know how your red blood cells kind of resemble like that donut shape, okay? Mm -hmm. They're more round and they bust easy. So that's why they have anemia. It's just we have to figure out what type of anemia it is, okay? So colon bacteria also synthesize vitamin K and biotin. You don't need to be buying the biotin. You're already making it. You're just wasting your money, okay? So synthesize vitamin K. Every baby that comes out, Miss Richards, right? Going to give them a vitamin K shot? Why? Why? They what? No. Who wants to who wants to tell her? Why? They're sterile. They're sterile. There's nothing in that gut yet. And you're getting colon bacteria. That means you have to introduce bacteria. Okay? Alright. I'll I'll get your attention. C diff. Who's dealt with it? <laughs> okay, who wants to tell the ones that are not medical about C. diff? It was nasty. Well, well we got to go more than nasty. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like, it's hard to, you can smell it outside of the room. Like, it's a sour smell, it yeah. looks yellow, it's, it's a spore. Very, it's like mucusy looking. Mm -hmm. like, and it's a spore, it's which means it's a lot, it's a lot hardier it, than bacteria. Oh. It's, it's covered with a round casein, a very hard, it's hard to kill, okay? Yeah. And so we try to, people that take a lot of antibiotics and stuff end up getting things like C. diff, okay? Mm -hmm. C. diff can de deplete you of fluids, electrolytes, cause major problems, okay? And for some people that we cannot seem to help with antibiotics and things for this, we do, what is it, Melody? A fecal transplant. A fecal <laughs> transplant? You don't say. What are they doing? They take somebody else's. They're healthy stone. And put it in there. <laughs> it's healthy stone. It's like, like, oh, did I get your attention, Kai? <laughs> yes. Well, you got a cafeteria today. The you're not serving feces, but for a fecal transplant, you will be served feces. Although you're not eating it with a spoon, they put it into a tube that goes up your nose, that nasal gastric tube we talked about. Sometimes well, if you have a nasal gastric tube going right to gastric, mm -hmm. I've seen them put that and go all the way in and, yeah. <laughs> I figured it went up the other Oh, way. I got your attention now. Oh, it yes. Goes and it goes down. And so we really, and, and then, and then, you ready for this? We like to get it from a family member, so yeah. now you get very close. <laughs> and you're so grateful for that family member because you look at them and you go, thank you for your bacteria. You <laughs> saved my life. <laughs> yeah, because what? it's thrown everything off. Does that make sense? Okay? Yeah. I I'm glad you knew about it, so you've seen it. Yes. Okay. She's saying I yes. I have seen them do it now. Okay. okay. I yeah. So when I first learned about that, I, I, I thought I would faint on the floor when I first learned about that. I thought, you got to be kidding me. But it makes perfect sense because the normal flora of the gut is all thrown off, okay? And, and then when they said the, the bacteria from a family member, <laughs> hey, Mom, I'm going to need a little bit of your stool, <laughs> okay? Think about it. All right, so a colon microflora, more than 1,500 species of bacteria are found in the normal GI tract. The kinds of microflora differ according to your genetics, your diet, your physical environment. This is why we're asking for a family member genetics. Plant-based diets support species associated with positive health, and antibiotics can permanently change the microbial community. I don't teach you guys farm, but I have taught farm. I'm gonna tell you this, okay? If you take antibiotics, they cannot decipher between good bacteria and bad bacteria, so they just wipe it all out. And what do you experience? Well, 
GI, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, not abnormal. You can't come to me as a patient and say, I'm allergic. Well, what, what are your symptoms? I have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. No, you don't. You have side effects. See where I'm going? Okay? This is about educating them. All right? Because is it important for people to finish their antibiotics? Yes. Okay? Yeah. And if, if the floor is really thrown off, it's not just a GI tract. Sometimes it's the vaginal area. Yes or no? You're calling the doc up going, I have a nice little yeast infection. Everyone with me on that? Okay? I don't take antibiotics. I just don't. Okay? And if I'm forced to take them, I want a diflucan with it, please. Thank you. Because I'm going to get a yeast infection. It happens every time. I just try to let my body handle its own. Okay? But my antibiotics will change, and that's what's happening with C. diff. They've been on antibiotics for a long time, and now you've changed the flora. Okay? So bacteria acquired through vaginal versus cesarean uh, delivery, a breast versus formula feeding may influence the health status throughout life. Uh, they're learning tons and tons about the uterine environment and how that even influences things like dental caries, okay, on babies, and what you develop hypertension and disease-wise just by looking at the growth of the baby and what the baby's influencing or is influenced by in the uterus. You're going to learn about that maternity, okay? All right, bacteria from the colon make up about one-third of fecal weight, and the color of stool comes from amines, especially indole and skatol, that formed by the action of bacterial enzymes on amino acids, okay? So some of your color is coming there too, okay? So they talk about people that have excessive gas. Do you know of anybody that has excessive gas? Flatulence, we're talking about? Flatulence, yes, okay. All right, colonic bacteria are major contributors to gas production. And sometimes flatulence can smell, and sometimes it doesn't smell, yes or no, okay? So my ex had his weak system of GI, he had excessive gas, thank God I didn't smell, and thank God I can't smell, okay? But boy, I could hear him, okay? Sound like a party favor in the house. So. Carbon dioxide, hydrogen, methane, and sometimes hydrogen sulfide, okay? Gas is produced by bacterial fermentation of undigested or incompletely absorbed carbohydrates. Uh -huh. So with the condition of his pancreas, it made perfect sense when I started seeing more gas. I knew what was happening, okay? All right, certain polysaccharides. Poly means what? Many. Many sugars, okay, in grains, fruits, legumes, which are? Beans. Beans, very good. And vegetables cannot be broken down by human digestive enzymes and absorbed. Okay, see you later, <laughs> right? Excessive gas has social implications. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Okay. Odor is associated with the hydrogen sulfide and then cru cruciferous vegetables and beer are high in sulfur. Ain't no beer drinking in my house. Okay? Smelly. All right? So various over-the-counter products claim to reduce the formation of gas or eliminate gaseous od odors, but they all have limitations, okay? Things like gas X, yes or no. Mm -hmm. And the main ingredient in all these is simethicone. Okay, and it comes in two doses, 80 or 160, okay? So waste elimination, approximately four hours after a meal is consumed, it enters the cecum, four hours, okay? So think about that. So like four hours, four o'clock after you guys have lunch, 3.30, four o'clock, that's when it enters the cecum, okay? And so approximately eight hours later, it then reaches the sigmoid, long time. Feces are usually stored in the descending colon. When the descending colon is full, feces <coughs> pass into the rectum, causing that urge to defecate. And so the spinal nerves for that run very low. They're low down here. Okay, they're right down here. So if I end up having any type of low back surgery, uh, low back issues, things like that, could it affect defecation? You better believe that. And so working on a neurofloor, when we talk to patients about doing lumbar laminectomies and things of this nature, we have to explain risk. 
what is the risk? Well, you may have a problem defecating or you may have a problem holding it, okay? So again, we have to weigh out risk and benefits in medicine. That's always gonna be the way it is, okay? So anal sphincters under voluntary control regulate the elimination of feces, okay? Two, smooth muscle, you have no control over it, okay? Say smooth muscle with your intestine, you're sitting there, it's contracting on its own. You're not telling it, contract, contract, contract. It would take you all day, yes, okay? But skeletal muscle, you have control over. So some chronic gastrointestinal diseases or distress. Uh, some people experience abdominal pain, bloating, early satiety. What does that mean? They're full early, okay? Uh, Post-meal discomfort, nausea, or vomiting on a regular basis, known as functional, and here's another word, dyspepsia, D-Y-S, do you all see that? Okay, can mean difficult, okay? If I ask a patient, okay, or I tell the doctor the patient has dysuria, okay, that's difficult or painful, okay? If I have dyspnea, <gasps> I'm having a difficult time breathing, but this is still this, okay? So sometimes no disease or structural explanation can be found, increases health care costs, decreases productivity, affects vitality and quality of life. People call out for GI, yes or no? Mm -hmm. I have a stomach bug, okay? You really don't want to be somewhere if you're too busy, you know, praying to the porcelain god, yes or no, right? Okay, and then other factors may contribute to, to symptoms, and here is the emotional part, anxiety. If you found that your bowel movements and things have changed since you started nursing school, this is not uncommon because we're stressing you, yes or no? Okay, emotional stress, depression, prescription medications, we've talked about that, okay? Certain foods and chronic disease, all right? Let me look and make sure I have nothing else to add on there. Did that one? Oh yeah. Here is. Oh, this is interesting. Complementary and alternative medicine. Now, some people use alternative medicine. Take a look at this. Bismuth. That's in Pepto Bismol. Okay. And certain herbs. A, a herbs. A dangerous combination. Look at this. Bismuth containing medications like Pepto Bismol are used to ease gas and bloating. Okay but it also binds with the odor-causing sulfur compounds found in intestinal gals to help reduce odor and embarrassment. However, when combined with, what does it say there? Garlic, ginger, or what? Okay, with that, now they're gonna have a synergistic effect, additive effect, and these herbs act as anticoagulants. What does that mean? I'm gonna thin the blood, I wanna bleed. I'm going to thin the blood and I'm going to bleed. But Doc also has me on Coumadin. And I take this combination. Now can you see how bad this could be? <laughs> okay, so that's why we're always going to tell you, even when we go into men and men, you better start asking them about their herbs. When I worked in, in an <coughs> office and I had to get patients ready for surgery, I would say, say to them, are you taking vitamin E? And we're going to talk about this with vitamin E, and they'll say, yes, I'll, I'm, I'll tell them, you need to stop it seven days before your surgery because they'll bleed. Follow me? They'll bleed. Vitamin e. Huh? For vitamin, e. vitamin E. Yes. It makes the blood very slippery, too. Okay? Yeah. Believe me, in a C-section, OR, C-section, normal blood loss is 700 milliliters, okay? But I've seen C-sections go very wrong, very bloody, and I've actually seen one father step in a puddle of blood and right on his tail. And that blood is slippery, okay? And you can smell, like I'll never forget the smell of blood. You could smell the iron in blood, okay? Things like that. All right, looking at, we have some people, lactose intolerance, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, inability to digest or absorb lacto lactose because they have a deficiency of the enzyme what? Lactase, okay, that's the enzyme. Lactase breaks lactose into glucose and galactose. Undigested lactose absorbs water and is fermented by resident bacteria. It causes pain, diarrhea, bloating, and gas, okay? So what is it that you can't drink? 
Milk. You can't drink milk. Can you eat cheese? No. No. You can't eat cheese. A lot of times, people with with uh, lactose intolerance can eat cheese. I cannot. Some. Eat. There's different types. Of there cheese, is like different. Lighter. Yes, and so when we're making the cheese, okay, with the way that ta that spills away and making the cheese block, a lot of the lac a lot of the lactose is in that way. So that's what I'm saying. Some people can do it. She says you can. You said you can. And again, she's saying it depends on the cheese. Okay. So looking at infants usually produce enough lactase. Adult onset lactase deficiency is going to occur in. You ready? Eighty percent of blacks, Asians, and those of Mediterranean or Middle Eastern descent, and only twenty percent of Caucasians. That's why I'm saying certain ethnicities we see certain things. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Okay. Pardon? I wonder why that is with the, like, the lactose. I, the only thing that I can equate it to is it's just simple genetics there, lady. It's simple genetics. That's what it comes down to, the genome. Okay? And I, I will not waver from that. Okay? My mother worked in genetics for 15 years. I, I won't waver. Okay? There's a lot to be said. Okay? So most can tolerate 6 grams lactose equal to a half a cup of milk, up to 12 grams of lactose with a meal. I think it just depends. You have to decide if you want to try this, okay? And then different, um, different from a milk allergy, it's more common uh, in irritable bowel syndrome, celiac disease. What's going on with celiac disease? Gluten. What? Um, gluten. gluten, yes ma'am. Okay, we talked about cystic fibrosis, yes? and other di disorders that damage the intestinal mucosa. And I said to you, cystic fibrosis, you're producing so much mucus, you're just layering that entire tube of mucus. How are you going to absorb anything? You can't. That's why these guys with cystic fibrosis are so skinny. You think they're skinny because they can't breathe. Sure, if I had to choose between breathing and eating, I want to breathe. But the other problem is, is they can't absorb, okay? And then viral infection or antibiotics can cause temporary lactose intolerance, okay? And we are going to get into some things with viral, but I'm going to just tell you right now with viral and viruses, okay? Viruses are pieces of DNA, RNA. They inject themselves into your cells, and then your cells become a little factory to reproduce them. Everybody with me on this? But viruses do something funny sometimes to people. And it, do you have anybody that has an autoimmune disorder? Uh-huh. Do you know when that came on? I was born with it. You were born with it. Can't use you. Okay? So sometimes when people get a virus, they may develop an autoimmune disorder. So viruses are very funny little things. Okay? It wouldn't be uncommon if they say, I just, I wasn't like this, and now I'm like this now. And if you ask them, did you have a cold? Or did you, yeah, I did. Or I had a stomach bug. Yeah, I did. And then they develop something. Changes them. Okay. All right, so to maintain adequate calcium intakes, gradually increase dairy food intake to support growth of small intestinal bacterial colonies that produce lactase. <laughs> She's like, I'm not trying it. No. Okay, <laughs> includes lactose-containing foods with a meal or snack. Choose low-lactose dairy foods. You could add lactase drops to break down the lactose. Has anyone done that? Can you try that? They have these little pills, like lactate pills. Okay. They and don't work for me personally. They don't work for you? No. Okay. Anyone else try them? No? Okay. And then take, la that's the lactase tablets right before eating. Okay. So again, if you're dealing with a patient with a pancreatic issue and you have to give them enzymes, please remember those enzymes, typically we mix them in like applesauce to make sure that the patient swallows them. Okay. You don't want them left on the lips, they'll start eating away at the tissue, okay? But they, they, these things have to be given before a meal, before every meal, okay? All right, and then prebiotics are indigestible carbohydrates, often oligosaccharides. Now, oligo means few or scanty, okay? Few or scanty, uh, such as cellulose, hemicellulose, and pectin. Pectin is what we see in Jello that makes it kind of congeal, okay? Uh, resistant to digestive secretions of the stomach and small intestine. 
Uh, they're fermented in the colon by existing microflora. They stimulate growth and activity of health, healthy bacteria such as your lactobacillus and the fetobacterium, okay, and they lower the pH in the colon, reducing pathogenic bacteria such as clostridia, okay, but the big one is uh, helicobacter or H. pylori, okay? Anybody ever have that infection? Oh, no, you didn't. How old were you when you had it? That's what I, that's what I was going to say, 20s. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I had another student that had it in the 20s. That actually increases your risk for stomach cancer. H. pylori has been found. When we see people with ulcers, they typically also have H. pylori, okay? And H. pylori is a part of ulcer formation, okay? So we have to treat the H. pylori as well as the ulcer. So you're taking antibiotics and omeprazole, right? Yeah, okay? Prebiotics with fermentation of prebiotics also produces short chain fatty acids such as butyrate, energy preferred sor sources of mucosal cells. Okay, they occur naturally in fibers found in wheat, onions, bananas, garlic, soybeans, artichokes, and asparagus. And then positive effects of prebiotics support immune function and prevent something called leaky gut. Megan, have you ever heard of leaky gut? You never heard of leaky gut? Is it going into detail with leaky gut here? Huh? Okay, and so I didn't think so. I just did a little research on it with the ex because he was looking at it. But that leaky gut is just like you're chronically bloated. You just don't feel well, right? Okay, so you got to kind of look that up. We're not going to touch that, but that's what leaky gut is, okay? Increase mineral absorption and promote normal laxation. Okay, a laxative effect. Probiotics can be obtained in food and dietary supplements. Most commonly common strains are Lactobacillus, Bitobacterium, and the yeast Saccharomyces boulardii. And I can tell you as a nurse, I have given this as medication to patients, okay? So lactic acid producing bacteria are used to acidify and preserve foods. Things like cultured milk and yogurt, cheese, distilled mash, potato, distilled mash, I'm not sure what that is, pickled cabbages, and is that spell right? Temp Tempe. What is it? Tempeh. Tempeh? Tempe? Yeah. What is that? I'm not sure it's what that a is. Vegan, uh, oh, a vegan. Soy product. Is it, yeah, it's a soy product. Okay. It's okay. cultured. It's like a cultured uh, fermented bean. Okay, very good. So pro probiotic cultures are available from pharmaceutical companies, and again, you will be giving that to some people, okay? So even with the GI issue that I had, I was taking Activia. And so the students were like, oh, you, that's gonna make you poop more. Da -da 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 -da. And I said, no, you guys have to understand, I have to take it because I'm trying to replace some of the flora because everything's thrown off, okay? So several clinical applications of probiotics, they'll use them with inflammatory bowel disease and Crohn's, okay? irritable bowel syndrome, traveler's diarrhea, and clostridium or C. diff infection, which we just talked about that, okay? May help prevent gastric cancer and inhibit the growth of, what does it say up there, Melanie? H. pylori, okay? May help prevent obesity, all right? Caution in individuals, though, with a compromised immune function or critical illness. You don't want to be introducing more bacteria with somebody that has a, a, a you know, or a, immunological suppression, okay? All right, are you guys hungry yet? It's almost done. It's almost done, we'll keep going then. So here we go, carbohydrate metabolism. Glucose is an immediate energy source in all body cells, preferred energy source for brain and nervous system, okay? You do not have any type of storage with regards to glucose for the brain. Is everybody with me on this? Yes or no? So even while you're sleeping, you're gonna secrete cortisol, which is gonna increase blood glucose, and that's what helps you with brain, okay? Especially when you think about sleeping eight hours, you're fasting, right? Okay? Carbohydrate sources of blood glucose, looking at dietary starches and sugars, glycogen stored in the liver and where? Muscle, and products of carbohydrate metabolism, such as lactic acid and pyruvic acid. Okay. 
non-carbohydrate sources of blood glucose. You're looking at protein and fat provide indirect sources of glucose because now we're doing glyconeogenesis, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Okay, so gluconeogenic amino acids form about 58% of the protein in a mixed diet. Glycerol makes up about 10% of fat intake. It's converted to glycogen in the liver and then glucose as needed. Formation of glucose from protein, glycerol, and carbohydrate. Metabolism is called, what did I just say? That's it. Okay. Uses of blood glucose, number one, energy production, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Okay, energy storage, as in glycogen, and then any extra is also stored as fat, yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, adipose tissue. And then glucose products, looking at examples, include the DNA and RNA, uh, looking at galactose and certain amino acids. Hormonal controls of blood glucose. So we're talking about the pancreas, yes or no? Mm -hmm. The endocrine function of it. Which cell is it secreting insulin? Beta. Yeah, beta have insulin, very good, okay? So from the pancreatic beta cells or the islets of Langerhans increases glycogenesis, lipogenesis, and cell permeability. That's what's allowing it to get into the cell, but it's still facilitated transfer diffusion, okay? You need to have the insulin. Okay, so those are the lowering, the lowering hormone <coughs> is insulin, yes or no? Mm -hmm. If you eat sugar, your sugar glucose in your blood's gonna go up, yes or no? In order to lower it and get it back down between the 70 and 110, you need insulin, that's the hormone to lower it. Now we gotta look at what's gonna raise it, okay? Blood glucose raising hormones, ready? Glucagon, okay? Steroid hormones, all right? Epinephrine, somatostatin, that's actually secreted by your delta cells in your pancreas. Growth hormone, and here it is, adrenocorticotropic hormone. Now, growth hormone is coming from where? Huh? Pituitary, thank you, Linda, thank you. And then adrenocorticotropic hormone, where is that coming from? Break down the word. Look at the adrenals, yes. And then you see cortico, you see cort? That's the cortex. Remember I showed you the adrenal gland on the board and I drew a medulla and a cortex, yes or no? And I said there's th three things secreted. Sugar, salt, sex. Yes or no? Yeah. yeah, remember? Okay, so that's what's going on here. Growth hormone and adrenocorticotropic hormone. Cortisol, you slept eight hours, you're not eating, you're fasting, your glucose, and while you're sleeping, it's going down, 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 down. Next thing you know, cortisol kicks in and it raises it. Does that make sense? Okay, try to make it as simple as I can. Okay, and then thyroxin, okay, thyroid. With lipid metabolism, two organ tissues are partners in lipid synthesis and breakdown. That is your liver and adipose tissue. And adipose is as it looks, it's yellow. You cut open up with somebody, it's yellow tissue, it's yellow fat, okay? Lipoproteins are produced in the intestinal wall after the initial absorption of dietary lipids and then the liver for constant recirculation to and from cells, what we talked about with those chylomicrons, right? Being circulated over and over and over again. Hormonal controls for lipid metabolism, lipid and carbohydrate metabolism are interrelated, so many of the same hormones are involved. So we're looking at growth hormone, ACTH, and thyroid stimulating hormone. There's your cortisol, okay, and corticosteroid. Okay, steroid, it almost sounds like a steroid, yes? Okay, and then epinephrine and norepinephrine and then insulin and thyroxine. So they're both pretty much the same, okay? Just for hormonal controls for lipid metabolism. Protein metabolism, you all heard of anabolism and catabolism, yes or no? What does catabolism do? Breaks down. Breaks down, excellent. Whereas anabolism is tissue building, okay? 
The process of anabolism builds tissue through a synthesis of a new protein directed by a DNA pro a blueprint. All right, let me see if I can explain this. have a cell, right? You have a nucleus in the cell that contains all your DNA, yes or no? Okay, on the, you, you learned about, in cells, you learned about the mit mitochondria, yes? Those are the powerhouses, everybody with me on that? Okay, you learned about ribosomes, yes? You learned about endoplasmic reticulum? Boy, I'm throwing some words out there, huh? Taking you way back, that's chapter three, okay? But what's gonna happen, it's interesting, is that you have endoplasmic reticulum, and these are like little highways, if you will, okay? And so what will happen, and then you have little ribosomes in here, okay? And what will happen is they'll start making new proteins, okay? So the ribosome is like a little manufacturer, and I'll show you a video when we come back from lunch. But the protein may come in looking one particular way, and after it goes through the ribosome, it's going to come out maybe looking a little different. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll find a video and I'll show it to you so you can see how we are making proteins all the time. Is somebody with me on that? Okay, so I'll see if I can show you a video because I don't think you're going to get it with what I'm drawing. Okay, but all of these things take place with making proteins. Okay, and then to make proteins, that's how we can make tissue. You with me? And how we can build tissue. Okay. Catabolism, tissue breakdown, amino acids released from tissue breakdown are reused to make a new protein or broken down for other purposes. Breakdown of these amino acids yields two parts, okay? The nitrogen-containing group via deanimation, we're going to clip that nitrogen-containing group off, okay? And then the remaining non-nitrogen residue, which is keto acids, okay? Keto acids. I think in the A and P module, and I think it's module three, I think I have videos there if you guys want to watch the videos of making proteins and things like that because it has to do with cells, okay? All right, so metabolic interrelationships. Each chemical reaction in the body is purposeful. All reactions are interdependent. They fill two essential needs. Okay? They produce energy and they support growth and maintenance of healthy tissue. If a kid is not very well nourished, is the kid going to grow? No. I've seen five-year-olds look like this, and I've seen five-year-olds look like this. Okay? And it tells me a lot. Does it not? Okay? All right, so controlling agents are your cell enzymes, your coenzymes, and then special hormones. This is one of your test questions. Again, on the test bank. The substance that activates pepsinogen to pepsin is what? Good girl. How many people went right to D? Okay, so it is hydrochloric acid. So I'm going to tell you another test taking technique. Are you ready? If you cover the answers and you treat it like a fill in the blank, You'll get the answer, you'll, and you'll stick with what came to your mind instead of getting all confused going, but, 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 because but just builds your case to pick the wrong answer, right? Mm -hmm. So if you just cover the answers with these, this particular test, these tests coming up, they're very straightforward, yes or no? I mean, that's as straightforward as it gets. There's no rationale here. It is what it is. So it's like A and P all over again, okay? And so if you cover up the answers and that comes to your mind, and you see that answer, you pick it. That's what I did, because she told us to do that on the last one. Okay, and if you don't see the answer, then what you're doing is you're not reading the question right. So it stops you and it makes you read the question again. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, just another test taking technique. Oh, there's Peppy again. <laughs> little Peppy, my little hound dog. Red bone hound and what was the other one? Red bone hound and I can't think what the mix was now. She's a good dog. <laughs> All right. Y'all take lunch till 12.
Thank you. 